Hey guys, it's Martin from News Culture, and today we're chatting with Mark Long, author of the graphic novel Rubicon and head of media entertainment. Also with us today is Con and our resident audio guy Paddy. So, hey Mark, it's great to have you with us. Thanks for taking the chat with us. How are you today? Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, it's, it's really good to uh, have you home with us. So, what time is it where you are now? It's pretty late for us over in the UK. Oh, it's uh, early afternoon here in Las Vegas. <laughs> Las Vegas, hey Martin, you should really hear about what it is that Mark is doing. You really need to talk to him about Rubicon. He's out there at the moment, and they are looking um, for some actors for filming Rubicon. It's going to be a web series. It sounds absolutely amazing. So that's that's yeah. straight in the Rubicon, sh- there, I guess. Yeah, uh, Machinima is um, financing a web series, and uh, we've written a prequel to the graphic novel and we're shooting, uh, what we're doing here in Vegas is training our actor uh, to shoot and fight, and then we're going to shoot the first scene out in the desert. We'll take a break and go on to Los Angeles and shoot in another two weeks. You know, Martin, do you mind if I jump in and, and ask Mark no, a question here? Mark, have you decided who the actor, um, all the actors are going to be yet, or have you just got just a, a small selection at the moment? Uh, we've got a lead actor for this uh, prequel, and uh, in this pilot, it's really just him, and uh, it's all uh, bad guys. Are you allowed to say who the actor is yet, or is that a closely guarded secret? Um, we haven't signed him, so I don't want to appear to be secretive, but I'm worried if I gave him the name and he backs out the last second. <laughs> <laughs> The same actor, uh, but he's been in a number of uh, feature films and he's played uh, military characters before, so we're really happy. Well, uh, I can tell you the director is a guy named Christian Thompson, um, and his uh, claim to fame is uh, a faux documentary that you will never believe this, but he went to Afghanistan in 2002 and he shot. Uh, the documentary there using the war uh, as a backdrop. Oh, wow. And so the guy's got wow. an incredible set of nuts on him. And uh, also, he knows how to shoot uh, guerrilla style. And uh, that, you know, that means small cameras, no lighting, um, and also no pr- permissions. That sounds great. You know what? I'm going to hand you back over to Martin, but before I do that, I just want to say I went to drama school, so if this guy drops out, you know what? I can be on the next flight to LA. It's not a problem. Just let me know. <laughs> be careful what you uh, wish for. Hey, it's, I'm uh, all there, like 100, <laughs> It's 110 degrees here. I just spent a day out in the desert. And I was, I, you know, was a little baby. I wanted my, I wanted to get back into air conditioning. <laughs> uh, you, should, you should join us over here. It's nice and cool. If not called. <laughs> so, I mean, <laughs> Rubicon is a modern reimagining of um, the, well, classic Salman book, Seven Samurai. And it's it's set in, well, I guess, current day Afghanistan. So, um, I mean, I, I know having read the book, it's, got, it's quite focused, it's very detail oriented, and the setting's very real. I mean, I guess, I guess, like, working on the film is much and whatnot. How's, like, being focused on the authentic elements of it being, like, a big thing for you? Like keeping it very well, it's, it's a big thing to me and my uh, co-creators. Uh, Dan Capel uh, is a ex Navy SEAL. Uh, he was SEAL Team Six and uh, Red Cell, and had a pretty incredible career in the teams. Um, and then Chris McCory uh, is. Uh, concept or idea was by Chris, story by him. And Chris is the uh, the uh, uh, screenwriter for Usual Suspects, and his most recent film was Jack Reacher. Jack Reacher is massive in the cinema recently, so let's hope Ruben Collins is yeah. just as big, if not bigger. Yeah. So, I, I mean, how, how did Rubicon come together? Like, was it, a, was, it a, uh, was it a natural thing, or was a lot of work involved? Sure. Um, well, it's a funny story. I mean, Dan and I knew each other through uh, working together on uh, game projects. He was a technical advisor on a couple of game projects. 
And uh, Chris has a brother who's a SEAL. And so the three of us each knew each other, but not as a group. And we had this kind of drunken dinner in um, Los Angeles a little over three years ago. And we're talking about things that we wanted to do that we were never, you know, we're just commercially uh, box office poison and, um, but that we were passionate about. And Chris said, I want to do a movie, something with seals in Afghanistan, something like, um, the movie Zulu. And I went, Oh God, that's such a good idea. <laughs> and I bit my knuckle. You know, I love that film. And, uh, I got home and I just couldn't get it out of my head. And I emailed Chris and I said, you know what's better than Zulu would be Seven Samurai because you have the warriors protecting the innocent villagers. And, and Chris said, yes, exactly. And with the opium poppy standing in for rice and the Taliban for the bandits, it's a great idea. And uh, so we decided to collaborate on it um, together. And, uh, you, as you can imagine, it's very intimidating for me to turn in pages to an Oscar-winning screenwriter. Uh, but I had awesome support in Dan for you know color, kind of colorful anecdotes and ideas. There's a lot of uh, Dan in the book, and so in terms of accuracy, um, the the technical and tactical details are there. But I think which is more important to Dan and I was kind of the emotional authenticity of these characters. Often these guys are kind of portrayed as uh, elite, you know, cold killing machines and who suffer, you know, maybe psychologically. And But nothing could be further from the truth. I find Dan to be, you know, richly, uh, emotionally evolved guy, you know, who grieves for his friends openly, uh, but also has no problem killing guys, right? <laughs> and, uh, so it's an amazing contradiction and, uh, in, in, you know, just uh, uh, an amazing uh, friend to have. Uh, how, was it, how was it putting yourself in, I guess, the mind space of these, like, almost unique characters? Was there anybody you felt you particularly identified with? Was there any character that you, know, you wrote with yourself in mind? Well, the main character, um, uh, Mike or... Uh, in the book, uh, it's a different character, Hector. Uh, I really modeled after Dan. It was easy to draw him because, uh, you know, I knew Dan so well, and you know, I would, I would just hear his voice when I was writing it. <laughs> if you remember uh, Seven Samurai, and by the way, if you haven't seen that film in a while, it's just a masterful in probably the original version of kind of the man on a mission film, you know, where they get the team together and then they go on a mission. But unlike any other, uh, Kurosawa develops, uh, each character so well that you really remember each one of these guys when often in these films, it's, it's hard even to tell them apart on camera. They're, they're so one dimensional, right? But the, the real heart of the film is, uh, the Mafuni character, the kind of wannabe samurai who's, um, you know, comical in his uh, desire to be like these other warriors. And we have the same character in the graphic novel. His name is Bolton. And he's what's derisively called a fob. Uh, a, a fob is a forward op operating base. And a fob is kind of a wannabe warrior who never really leaves the base and uh, exaggerates his... Uh, experiences right but by having this character who's so un warrior like you're able to contrast his behavior you know to the others and in that contrast you see you're able to tease out more subtle uh, emotions and also uh, even though this character is a walking joke um, all his actions are very heroic and you're able to see in, in that contrast, you're able to see the, his heroism in, in many ways uh, he shines a light, you know, on the other characters actions who were kind of more silently uh, competent, right? It's a genius stroke of genius by Kurosawa when he wrote the screenplay and uh, the graphic novel is very much an homage to uh, the film. And so, 
we uh, ha- have the same flavor of characters, if you will. I think it, you've certainly got, like, a, I guess, a rich tapestry to work from. I mean, the novel, like, no, the novel, I guess, the film as well is, I guess, it's also an aged piece now. Uh, like, Rubicon especially is set in the world of today. How did you feel that like the setting affected the story? Did you feel there was a lot of different factors to work with? Did that change the story anywhere? Well, you know, um, in many ways, it's a timeless classic, you know, with a transcends uh, time, and, and that was a, a fun part of adapting the story in that these things happen uh, all the time in war. And one of our goals when you're asking about authenticity is, you know, what is the true nature of war um, beyond, you know, acts of heroism, sacrifice, loyalty? What, other, what are the other lessons and hard questions that we can ask ourselves? And one of the harder questions that you just don't see explored very well or often that, uh, you know, this is Dan's idea that we try to do in, in opening and closing the book is often in, in feature films, you know, the family or the wife or girlfriend is, you know, portrayed as this kind of, you know, Hollywood gorgeous that's kissed and you know, we don't see again for the rest of the story. But a bigger question, I think, is does a... A, you know, a professional warrior like this, um, are they uh, violating the love for their family by, you know, potentially sacrificing their lives for their country? How do you come to terms with that contradiction, right? And so we try to illustrate uh, how often these Tier 1 guys, to get to their level of their career, you know, they're usually 10 years older than their contemporaries and uh, so often, you know, have um, an ex-wife and maybe kids. But, you know, by the nature of who they are, they will have maybe a hot mess of a girlfriend, you know. And so these complex uh, romantic and emotional and family lives they're trying to manage on top of, an, uh, you know, kind of unyielding uh, career where you're expected to give anything and everything at any time, you know, how do you balance all those things and, you know, basically have a life outside uh, the teams. And uh, it's something that we've added to the Seven Samurai story that I'm really happy about. It's, I think it's a really emotionally deep story as well. It does a lot to humanize the characters as well, which I guess, like like you said, you know, takes away from the Hollywood gene. I mean, you yourself are a military man. You've worked with the U.S. military before, I believe, in creating VR systems to train troops. What what was it like working with the military in R&D? I'm sorry, segueing away from Rubicon. Well, first of all, I don't consider my experience terribly relevant. It was a long time ago. I like to say, you know, we had spears and shields back then, so (laughs) (laughs) it's a lot different. Uh, But I think anybody that has... uh, you know, volunteered and, and stood there watch has an eye and ear for uh, the details that are uh, authentic and ring true. And um, I think that's a, uh, at least in, in the kind of fiction that I'm enjoying right now, like in the United States, we're watching the end of the Breaking Bad series. And one thing that's not often uh, talked about in the success of that series is kind of how authentic everything feels. Like you never feel bumped in the story or a character. You always feel like, yeah, they would really do that. And that's complex, you know, in, in that storyline where characters are doing things that, you know, a, a, a chemistry teacher, high school chemistry teacher doesn't, you know, normally do that kind of thing. It's also complex in our story where we're trying to represent an a emotional dimension of our characters that you don't normally experience in the genre. Uh, so on the one hand, we want you to see maybe the truth, but on the other hand, we don't want you to you know, not understand or believe that that's how things uh, really are. So it's great, again, to have a technical advisor like Dan that can say, well, no, you know, um, you know I, I asked him up front, like, you know, dude, you had so many of your friends uh, die. I mean, you're super close to these guys, closer than you are maybe to your own family. 
you know, um, how do you deal with that? It's like, dude, you know, we openly grieve. Like, I'm, I'm professional at grief, like, just as much as I am professional at killing. And you have to, you know, kind of embrace the suck and, and uh, process that. And that was very surprising to me. And we have a scene in the book where this character, you know, when he gets alone, just uh, breaks down and sobs. And when he joins his teammates, they're real concern is, you know, for each other and, and uh, for the loss of their friend. Uh, I think it is it's very nice to see something actually focus upon, I guess, like you had to say, the more human side of it. Um, so, I mean, we talked a lot about Rubicon. Also, as as the, as the uh, head of media entertainment, you've worked closely with Hawken as well. How do you feel that I guess Hawken, as a contrast to Rubicon, do you feel like Hawken's progressing in the story? It's a well, I guess his world. It's become a universe now, isn't it? Yeah. Well, uh, with Hawken and both Rubicon, we're you know doing um, you know what's called transmedia uh, designed. Uh, transmedia is a fancy word for telling a story across multiple media. Um, it's different than. Um, what's sometimes called licensing where, you know, you have a successful film and then maybe you want to make a game of it where you just try to recreate the game, the movie in the game, or you really tell the story in a, in a comic or prose novel. Transmedia avoids that. There's no retelling. Instead, you want to explore uh, other elements from the story, but they have to all be integral and um, contiguous if, if they can be. So, uh, Hawken has, uh, you know, the game itself and the time period it's set in. Uh, the graphic novel is kind of a prequel to that world, and it explains it. There's a comic series, a prose novel, and uh, even a feature film in development along with the web series. So we're like, you know, going to get our transmedia merit badge, if you will, <laughs> after this is done. But uh, everything was very deliberately designed to be connected to one another so that each piece could stand alone. But if you were a fan and you played the game and you, I don't know, read the graphic novel and then watched the movie, you would say, oh, my God, there's three things that that character, you know, is connected in this way, and that's why this happened. And you get uh, what's sometimes called additive comprehension. Like, you put these things together, and now you understand better. It's, you could have understood the film fine without doing anything else, but... It makes your experience that much better. Uh, it's. I think transmedia. I love the idea of transmedia. I mean, I think there's a lot of universities, both film and game, where we go into them and we really enjoy them. We come out really begging for more, wanting to know what happened before and after. And it, it's really nice to see like transmedia really flesh that out. It's something I'm very excited to see, especially in Hawking, which I immediately fell in love with. Have you played much Hawking yourself? You were you good at it. Oh yeah. Yeah, we practically play every day in the office. Um, we have just released the biggest update to date in uh, Hawken, and uh, we've been uh, playtesting internally the build uh, for several weeks and have now just uh, released it. I encourage everybody to go to playhawken.com, download it, and give it a shot. We, um, um, we and the guys at the uh, News Culture podcast played it uh, this week, actually played a good hour of it together. I'm a bit worried now, so I was going to ask you to play with us, but it seems like you're probably a lot better than we are. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm pretty good as long as I'm hidden really far away with a really big gun. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Martin, I think you did really, really well. You got me a few times on that one. Uh, <laughs> Go on. No, I'll let you speak. I was going to ask, actually, you know, listening to, to the story unfold with Rubicon and how you got involved to it and uh, listening to Christopher and Dan and how you've got them on board and such, with um, with certain films and games, you see little Easter eggs, little things from uh, other films and games that uh, helps in, inspire the universe. I know that um, Hawking is done by uh, Adhesive Games and produced um, by Meteor Entertainment, but... Are there little bits of Rubicon in Hawking? Have you managed to sneak in some some Easter eggs, or is this something that maybe you're trying to work on, or, or is that are we never going to see that happen? But those two worlds are entirely separate. But within the world of Rubicon, or sorry, Hawking, you definitely see you know what you're calling Easter eggs, and they're very deliberately designed for you know fans to discover 
uh, on their own. And um, this is something that you have to put a great deal of effort into in the beginning uh, to make the pieces all fit together. But um, as a fan myself, when creators do that, I'm super excited about it. I think for me, the best example is the Matrix and how when the second Matrix came out and the game came out and the Animatrix, the, the DVD shorts all came out, they all came out, you know, I think within a couple of months of each other. There was a, a short in the Animatrix that connected to the game, that connected to the movie. And when I saw that scene in the movie, it's basically delivering a letter to Morpheus that tells him that the machines are digging to Zion. In the video game, you play Ghost and Niobe, who are trying to get that letter out of the postal system. I and think I remember Morpheus. that. Yeah. yeah, and then in the Animatrix, you'll remember the short where they're trying to get the letter into the mailbox. I saw all three, and then when I saw the movie, it was like, oh, that's so cool. And it's such a tiny element in the scene, but it connected the thread. And uh, it's, it's just really satisfying as a fan when you know, you see that all put together. And the, the antithesis is usually what we experience where you're really into a fiction and then the, some writer, you know, for a comic or maybe even the feature doesn't get a detail right and it really bumps you. You're like, dude, you know, come on, I'm just a fan, but even I know that, you know, those things aren't connected and um, it kind of ruins it for you, right? <laughs> I think that's the sound you've made it when you know that your fans are so invested that it can actually pull you up the oddest things. And I think we see that in some of the really big game universes now, things like I know World of Warcraft, for instance, we see like really militant fans that know more about the game than developers do. And it's really nice to see something like Transmedia really help like connect that with that, like, the fans of the game and like grow a universe around it. Um, yeah, and... You're, sorry, you're starting to see more and more, too, where um, creators understand that uh, the fan uh, enthusiasm and fiction, like their own ability to create, um, should be integral into your um, plans uh, creatively. And uh, you're beginning to see more and more hooks like that designed for fans to create their own fiction. Or, you know, the old school example is, releasing the level editor and letting fans produce their, you know, players produce their own levels, multiplayer levels. And then those levels kind of going through the process of being voted on, if you were, just by virtue of how, uh, you know, how many people love to play on those maps. I think, yeah, it's it's quite funny because sometimes you'll see that, I guess, some of the best maps are made by the players, you know, they're the guys that have been immersed in the universe. I mean, we spoke a lot about sort of the present, you know, Rubicon, Hawken, what do you think the future holds for things like Hawken and Rubicon? Where do you think we'll go from here? Well, um, Hawken, we uh, have great hopes for. You're just beginning to see um, some of the new levels and maps and worlds within uh, the game that we've uh, been designing and working on. You're going to be quite surprised by it. Uh, new art directions that the title goes. I mean, Hawkins got this kind of uh, Blade Runner crossed with um, uh, Machina Krieger look, if you know that Japanese toy. Um, and so it's got a very signature look. Uh, and the new Last Echo maps are, you know, very different. They're, you know, a forest map. And we have other maps coming out with a whole new look. And of course, all those are tied back to the fiction of the world. Um, for Rubicon, um, the web series we hope will be out, I think late October, November, look for it on Machinima. And uh, Rubicon was written as a trilogy. So if we are able to do a feature film, uh, there'll be also uh, a sequel, maybe a graphic novel. That's really cool. I'm definitely looking forward to Rubicon. I loved it. I'd love to see more from the universe. So, I, I mean, I think Cole will probably kill me if I don't ask. <laughs> Are you a PS4 or an Xbox One, man? Oh, which one? Yeah. Um, you know, we're up in Seattle, so i got to vote for my homeboys. You know, um, Xbox One, uh, they, you know, haven't done as good a job as communicating their intentions as PS4 
those guys are really agile in their marketing efforts, but uh, in the long run, I think uh, the Xbox is a superior um, online experience just by virtue of how long you know lives been in existence, and I think you can just see that it's going to improve. A lot of it has to do with the initial titles that are going to launch on the platform, and um, I have to say the one I'm most excited about is Battlefield 4. It's yeah, nice going to be something, yeah. I mean, Battlefield 3 was amazing so far. We'll blow someone talk, so I think it's going to be fantastic. I mean, yeah. also, also the Division, I mean, that one kind of blew me away. I wasn't expecting that at all from a, you know, a Clancy uh, IP, but it's pretty amazing looking. I think Tom Clancy is somebody who found his way onto uh, video games and has just firmly stayed there. I mean, that's, uh, that, I, yeah. I guess even Tom Clancy would be one of the very first um, examples of transmedia moving into video games. And mm-hmm. it's certainly mm-hmm. great to see. I think last question. Um, how do you think that the Oculus Rift will change the future of game development? Do you think it's a dawn of a new age for gaming? Or do you think it's simply a gimmick? That's a great question. You know, actually, I've been here once before when we we started my first uh, game studio, Zombie Studios, in 1993. We were working on a home virtual reality system for Hasbro. It was a it was a game system that was going to compete with Nintendo and Sega. And I was at a research laboratory in Princeton uh, called Sarnoff, where we had landed the contract and were designing and developing it. And uh, I. They killed the project right all the way at the last minute. Um, but we were convinced in 1993-94 that head-mounted displays were going to be the future of gaming. And we started our studio and designed a, a, a game called Locus. It was uh, um, it was kind of uh, uh, like rollerball in a 3D environment uh, where you, you know, were on the inside surface of a giant sphere or whatever. And it had, you know, it was designed for head mounts and had uh, 3D audio and all that. But the market didn't materialize. But the reason was all the things that Oculus has solved. Like, they were uncomfortable and heavy. And most of all, the the resolution of the displays were just really uh, disappointing. And the new Oculus display that I've seen, their high-resolution display is amazing, and the uh, HMD itself is like we're in ski goggles. We can wear it for hours. Um, I will be most excited when you see uh, a developer or creator make something specific for the Oculus. It just happens that I think the best experience in a Rift right now is Hawk, and, and that's just simply the nature of the game. You're inside a mech cockpit. Uh, it's a little harder with the first-person shooter. You know, you're you're supposed to have your uh, head in a certain position and your hands in a certain position, and it's hard to get the idea that you can just spin around, you know, uh, without turning in your chair. But uh, for whatever reason, Hawking really um, is a compelling experience. But I think the first one that's really designed for an HMD will answer your question whether or not we've finally arrived in an era of virtual reality entertainment. I think it'll be very exciting to see. I'm definitely looking forward to playing um, Hawking on the Oculus Rift. I know a lot of things, and like one of the things that the farms have been asking for is and like a sensor by your door so you can hear when people come into your house, given just how immersed you'll actually be in the Oculus Rift. So I, I'll be very yeah. nice to get your head into the game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe lock my doors first, though. <laughs> well, I think that's about as much as we've got time for today, Mark. So thank you for chatting with us. Um, if you guys at home want to check out Rubicon, I'll be in, for a chance to, be in for a chance to win one of the signed copies that Mark has kindly sent us. Hit the link below, and otherwise join us next Wednesday. We'll be back with the team podcasting. And maybe Mark might play some Hawking with us. I hope he goes easy on me, maybe. Yeah, you know. Oh, we might be able to catch up and play uh, Hawking with Mark sometime, but I think, you know what, we're going to need to wait for the Oculus Rift to get out there, and um, then we'll have to try and make his own game with uh, an Oculus Rift and see if we can see if we can beat him. <laughs> Mark, thanks again for your time. It was absolutely brilliant catching up with you. Really enjoyed listening to where Hawking and Rubicon are going. Uh, and, yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. 
Okay, guys, we'll see you again next week for Muse Culture. If you want to send us in any questions at all, remember to send it in to podcast at museculture.net. This is Martin, Connick, and Patrick signing off for Muse Culture. Guys, we'll see you again next week.